Today I'm talking with Skip Cuts. We're going to talk about his life in music and also his father's, Barney Cuts. He was born in England, 1911. When did he come to Canada? Um, well, he, he, my uh, grandfather emigrated from Russia, from Latvia, and my dad was born on the way over here. I think my dad had five or six brothers and, okay. and sisters, so they stopped in England for a while before they arrived in Canada. Uh, he was born there. Um, I think he must have been here sometime in the in the teens. I know he was very young, and um, my grandfather. <clears throat> they ended up in um, Edenbridge, which was one of two Jewish colonies in Saskatchewan. And the reason they went there is because I think they were offered five acres of land free if they clear it and then they would farm it and so on and so forth. The Enbridge cemetery, cemetery in a small synagogue still, it's still there. Uh, although I don't think there's hardly any Jews left in the minutes. Hey, hey, hey. There's an, hey, stop it. There's, there's no Jews left in the Melford Tisdale area or very few. Um, so the, uh, the Wildlife Federation actually runs it now. It's a pretty little spot just north of Star City. And there's another one near Estevan somewhere, you know. And there's not a lot of Jews in, in the province. So, and uh, when my dad passed away, that's where he was buried, up in the synagogue, up in the uh, cemetery there. Yeah. What was his roots in music? Well, he came here, um, and I imagine he had a, you know, it was a, a pretty small community at the time and I think when he was about 18 or 20 him and his sister moved to Montreal they decided they would leave here and go to Montreal and um, Obi uh, hey stop that my so they um, uh, they moved to Montreal and they actually made a living for a while being dancers they would do entertain at uh, um, you know, sh uh, various kinds of shows melodrama whatever that was at the time so and then he enrolled in the um, Quebec Conservatory he'd started bass um, and he began bass lessons and he was fortunate to be uh, take from uh, Roger Charbonneau who's the principal bass of the Montreal Symphony so he actually learned his trade um, in Montreal. Uh, he was there for quite a few years and ended up, I think he played in the McGill Chamber Orchestra, did some classical music, but ended up kind of in the more popular music of the day, uh, played in the Jimmy Lang Orchestra. They worked um, everywhere from the Chateau Laurier to the Al in Ottawa to the Alberta Lounge. Um, he did a several tours of the Caribbean um, out, out of Miami and going to uh, like Havana, uh, Bermuda, Jamaica, and um, he so and he worked as a musician for about twenty years, um, and that's where he met my mother. My mother uh, was a Irish Catholic from Montreal. I'm sure when her parents found out that my mother was hanging around with not only a musician, but a Jewish socialist musician and things like that. They weren't very pleased. Anyway, they, uh, they got married and when, when my grandfather, who was in Saskatoon, who was a master tailor, became ill in the 50s, my dad and mom and myself moved back to Saskatoon. So he worked for about 20 years and had, I think, a pretty uh, amazing, he told me a few stories in the old days about um, you know, uh, how things were in Cuba and actually when in 1961 he went right after the revolution, he went back for a month and things like that because he said there was a lot of kind of abuse and a lot of abuse of the islanders and things like that from, um, you know, not only the Americans but Canadians and everybody else. So he, he has, he spent quite a bit of um, time, you know, touring, kind of playing and things like that, but he came back here. And um, that's when he hooked up with Gordy Grant. And Gordy had been in Toronto, uh, originally from here. I think my dad knew maybe Gordy's dad, who was in the furniture business. They had 
Beacon Radio and Electric and Brant's Furniture downtown. And Gordy, of course, was an extremely fine guitarist. And uh, they played for the next 30 years until Gordy's untimely death. He died at 59. Um, and they played everything from uh, probably the only jazz TV show in the 60s in, in the country. Um, and I have a video of, of the reunion of that. Um, uh, you know, on CFQC, they had a weekly show that my dad's business and Gordy's business sponsored, but with, with Bob Klass and Buddy Rogers. Uh, Len Barber on piano, Fred Ballantyne on piano, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, that was a real unusual thing for a small prairie town at the Do time. Do you know how the show came to be? Well, um, you know, there was a couple of jazz aficionados. Stan Thomas was one of them, and he ended up, I think, uh, after being with uh, CTV, he ended up with a global network in Winnipeg. He's back in town now. Um, so, uh, and Reed Brown, who's another producer there. So there was a couple of uh, jazz lovers there and they thought, you know, they had an obligation under CRTC to produce some local content. And this was an opportunity for them to put on something that was, uh, you know, good quality, uh, unusual, and, uh, and did it on a, a weekly basis in the winter season anyway. And that show ran for, I don't know, five or six or seven years and things like that so they prepared a what years would that be oh uh, that was probably starting around 62 to 68 something in in that you know so it was uh quite an unusual thing for i'm sure it was the only weekly jazz show probably in canada you know would they have learned all new material each week or just yes they uh, mostly jazz standards and audrey brandt was of course a fine singer she's still alive and we see audrey quite a bit um, and uh, she sang, you know, a couple of uh, feature numbers every week. And they would have, you know, because of the way they were trained and brought up in terms of Toronto, you know, you're, you're supposed to have, you know, four or five hundred tunes that you know that you can play in any key, um, you know, kind of at your disposal. So they were kind of a, you know, a, they, they, they had a repertory of a lot of music, but still it had to be prepared and organized every week. So it was quite a, quite an undertaking for people that had day jobs in those days too. Was it filmed live? So they don't get one Filmed tape? live, yes. Yeah, so there was a, any goofs were <laughs> recorded for posterity, you know, you know. Do you think uh, copies of the shows exist? You know, I'm not sure if they do or not. They did a reunion in the 70s, and I have a copy of that. Um, I think Fred Ballantyne played, and maybe it was Glenn Stevenson on drums. I'm not sure if it was Glenn or um, Bob Klassen and Audrey singing. Um, I don't know about the original shows. You know, the at the time, the uh, videotape, of course, was so expensive and didn't last long and things like that. I'm not even sure if it was reusable in those days. So I'm not Did sure. you ever get to guest appear on the show? No, I was a little... We came on once in a while at Christmas, you know, when the kids were invited on to the show. I was pretty young at that time, you know. I might have played once or twice, but, I, you know, yeah. foggy in my memory. And so then your dad also joined the symphony? He joined the symphony in the 50s when he got back. Um, and, of course... Uh, you know, anybody that played, especially a string instrument, was kind of, was really necessary for them to get involved. And, you know, almost all the people were, had other occupations or professions at the time and things like that. But there were some, you know, some very good players. Um, and uh, he, he spent 40 years as principal bass of the symphony. Um, and, um, and, of course, when I, I was in the junior symphony, like you, and um, I think when I was 14, I moved up into the senior symphony um, on cello because, of course, you know, there's never enough string players in those days in a town this size, you know. How, how did you get cello as your instrument? Well, I think my dad really didn't want me, he didn't really want to be my teacher. And things I didn't think that was a really good idea and things like that. So I started on, on cello and... Um, at the time, Murray Daskin, the head of the music department, who was a violinist, and Andrew Dawes, from the, who subsequently was the leader of the Orford String Quartet and, and Murray student, they lived over in the University Drive. So even though they weren't cellists, they got me started on the cello. 
And then when I was 10, I got a, well, we didn't have a lot of money. We lived on Avenue D and I got a little bit of a scholarship from the Women's Symphony Committee at the time. So I went every month to Winnipeg on the train when I was 10 by myself. And I, um, and I took lessons from Peggy Sampson, who was the principal cellist of the Winnipeg Symphony Orchestra. So I got a pretty good education, you know, although probably didn't put in enough time to be a, a great cellist. I was adequate, and that was about it, to be perfectly honest. And as I got a little older, I decided I really needed to switch to bass. I was much more interested in playing not only classical music on bass, but some more uh, jazz and pop and other things. So. Yep. Where did you go to school? Um, well, I went, uh, I went through the um, music, Bachelor of Music, uh, uh, music Education program at the University of Saskatchewan. Um, but prior to that, in terms of my, um, um, in terms of my uh, performance uh, education, I spent two, three summers and six weeks at a time at Jeunesse Musicale outside of Montreal. That was arranged by a family from Prince Albert Fournier's and it was a very professional uh, camp. Um, the, my cello teacher there was Guy Fallot from the Paris Conservatory. And then when I was a little older, I studied bass at uh, the Congress of Strings, which was sponsored by the Union and it brought together string players from all the locals in the United States and Canada because once again generally there was a uh, there was a dearth of string players at the time so they it was focused on younger players um, that might benefit from a six week so I spent a couple of years in uh, upstate New York where I took bass lessons uh, and, and for classical purposes so what years would you have uh, taken your university Course. I was there from 66 to 70. And so you're sort of in the whole midst of this whole rock revolution? And yeah, that, well, that and that's when I started. We had a, a group that we played a lot of, the, probably most of the university functions, usually under my name was Skip Cut Sextat with uh, Mary McLean. And so we did, at the time, there was a lot more formal dances at the university. We did kind of the college formals plus the graduation and things like that. So we played many things on a fairly you know regular basis over the time and um and so we worked quite a bit and there was a at the time a few clubs going that we played one of the significant ones was uh, barry singer's uh, uh club on on broadway um I'm trying to remember the name of it um he opened he had a head shop he became a judge, probably the only judge in Canada that has on his resume, he ran a head shop. Um, and, um, and we played at the, what was it called in Regina? Not the LaSalle, started with K. There was two hotels, we played each of them in Regina for like, a, I think it was either four or five days of the week. There was, at that time, that kind of, um, you know, weekly or four or five day a week job was just beginning so we got some work in that area and then in 1970 um, the group we had a group with horns we had you know which was kind of unusual at the time with uh, sax and trumpet you know piano uh, guitar bass we moved to Vancouver and I worked out of Vancouver for five years I did a little bit of um, subbing to k keep the wolf from the door, school subbing. That only lasted for two or three months and then I played full time because we worked for Bruce Allen <clears throat> out there and uh, Sam Feldman and if they liked you, you worked all the time. They ran the town and uh, so we played five and six nights a week, you know, for probably 40 weeks a year, 45 weeks a year um, and mostly in Vancouver. Right. Jumping back a bit, so you know I've been documenting uh, every musical gig advertised in the Star Phoenix. Right. So the earliest gig I have found with your name mentioned mm -hmm. is the Varsity Band at the University in 1964 oh, yes. mm -hmm. with uh, Mike Greiner, mm -hmm. Wayne Taylor, Randy Shaw, Al Nicholson, Rat Ratushni, yeah. and Garnet Spear. Do you remember that group? And I sure do. Stories? Yeah. And, uh, uh, once again, I mean, I was fortunate because there was no bass players around except my dad, and he didn't have 
enough time. So I there was a a big band that was sponsored by the kind of the students union at the university, um, with charts and they played the standard big band repertoire. So um, I think I was in maybe grade ten when I joined them, and they played. You know, some college dances, but they also had a Western Canadian tour. They did a recording, which I have a copy of with Barb Records at the time. And there was some pretty good, you know, players in the band. Mike Greiner was a drummer, and he was in, from North Battleford. He was the leader of the group. He's still with us. I think he lives in Victoria now. Um, Ed Ratushny was a federal prosecutor and things like that. And he played sax, Pete Johnson on piano. There were some very good very good players and at the time probably the only big band around that were there was subsequent to that there was like Bob Moyer's band in Regina and of course uh, many many years later Dean McNeil's here but there wasn't a lot of big band work so played with uh, with them I think my dad was a little concerned that the hard drinking um, boys in the band and I guess I just learned to you know drink along and things like that with a, you know, mm -hmm. at the I, I have a gig at the Suburban Restaurant, New Year's Eve, 1964. Oh. Ken Cuts and Orchestra. Oh, yeah. Well, that, and that could have been, uh, 64. I was probably in high school then. And that would be, um, I had a high school group when I went to Walter Murray with um, Claire Richmond, who was hum, from Humboldt, Barry Singer, who played trombone. I don't remember who else was in the was in the group. Maybe Mike Mullen, a friend of mine, playing drums and things like that. So we we played a few, you know, a few gigs in there. And of course, at that time, if you wanted to work kind of commercially, you joined the union. You got the scale. Um, nobody got rich, but we all got uh, you know uh, our minimums paid and things like that. And it was a New Year's Eve scale. So played a few gigs. I really started playing a lot of casual jobs when I hit university but I also I should say that I the other thing that I did I was kind of a journeyman bass player because it wasn't I played with the Jack Johnson Orchestra Jack was uh, subsequently a music teacher in Saskatoon um, I played with uh, Garnet Spear a little bit the Don Keeler Orchestra John Kolinchuk who was this city clerk at the time was really a fine um, violin, played played viola, I think, in the principal viola in the symphony, fine violin player. And he played a lot of the Ukrainian weddings, so I got to go through all the Ukrainian kind of material. Many of, much of the stuff was written, but um, uh, that, you know, that would make, uh, uh, you know, so I did a lot of kind of itinerant, you know, one night work, too, before that. As kind and of these are all nice. with on bass guitar. Uh, no, all on stand up bass mostly. Stand -up. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Trombone player, male man. <laughs> Kevin, Marsh. Kevin Marsh. Don't hey, calm down. So by the late sixties, you're playing a lot of gigs. Yeah. Mainly the skip cut sex I have lots yeah. of documentation. Mm -hmm. So how did you land up becoming the leader? Of your own group. Well, I guess maybe I got more more of the jobs. Randy Shaw did, you know, he, he was a little bit older. He might have graduated too before me, I think. And so I was on campus and I was kind of the connection. I was actually also the music director for the Students' Union at the time. They appointed me and I brought in um, uh, groups and things like that, mostly jazz festival. I brought Charles Lloyd in and Tommy Banks. <laughs> I had a budget, and so I did that for two years for the Students' Union. So I was quite well known on campus, and it just seemed to be uh, more people knew me, so I guess the group became known under my name. Okay. So what year, just to clarify, did you um, start the double bass, and what year did you start the bass guitar? Well, I started double bass probably, you know, probably around 61 or 62, and then... And probably 66 and things like that, I, I picked up the electric bass, uh, or 60, yeah, around 66 when I started playing a lot more. We, we played like a lot of jazz standards with horns and things like that, but we played some, uh, we played some um, 
you know, some pop tunes too, mostly instrumental kind of renditions, everything from, you know, kind of the letter you know, to, uh, you know, Rolling Stones tune, but much of it was done instrumentally, and we did a lot of cannibal latterly stuff, but it, the stuff that was more accessible, it wasn't really, um, you know, kind of a jazz show, in a sense, although there, we did some kind of jazz crusaders, more funk kind of stuff, and things like that, at the time. Did the Skip Cuts sextet have any favorite venue? Um, yeah, I'm trying to think about that, you know, we played probably with the, um, with the kind of work that we did, we probably played the Besbro and the Sheraton more than anything, you know, ballrooms there and things like that. So, um, there wasn't a lot of club work at the time, you know, um, there was some, but, uh, you know, we were a little large fitting fitting into those kind of venues and things like that for that kind of size of group. And um, probably after I left in 1970, probably the club scene came on much heavier in terms of where people went to enjoy music and stuff. The other thing I did, um, because I was the music director at the student union, I was kind of in charge of the cellar club right. at the university, which had you know existed before me, but I took that over and I got Michael Taylor from Humphrey and the Dump Trucks to book it and kind of be the MC every week. So we presented uh, a variety of, uh, you know, folk and alternative music in the basement of the Memorial Union building. And, you know, everybody, you know, the folk people would come through and they would book, uh, you know, book a night, much like kind of the basement now, but it ran one night a week and things like that. And it was strictly a coffee house at the time, you know. Mm -hmm. One of the interesting gigs I have documented in 1969, you played the Pig Club 21 on 8th Street. It was, I must have been into the uh, uh, dope by then, um, Terry, because I've not... So it's, a, it, it's a gig documented with you and Mary McLean playing. So okay. I presume it's just kind of I know that Harley lineup. Green. I know that Harley Greening, who was a friend of Dave... There was Dave Takacha, Carly Greening, and Lauren Horning, and they were kind of the impresarios of booking in those days. Okay, Dave T Dave Takacha ran Actron agencies, and Lauren Horning had a club, or no, um, Harley Greening had a club on E Street. I'm not exactly sure what it was called. We played there a few times, I know. Um, and those people, those the booking agents, we got quite a bit of work through them as well. You know. And even quite a few high school jobs, although we're not really the right kind of group for that, but they booked uh, jobs throughout the province. We're fortunate we didn't have to travel a lot, though we were pretty busy in town. There wasn't much competition, to be perfectly honest. It's not that we were that great, you know? So let's go into detail a bit more about the Skip Cat Sextet. Is this um, primarily instrumental group? Did you always have a guest singer or uh, well, always a lead singer? Yeah, Mary did most of the lead singing. She was away for a little while in Europe, but um, it was primarily an instrumental group. It started like that and things like that with the, you know, sax and trumpet lead lines. Uh, very good sax player, Torch David from uh, Dinsmore, Saskatchewan. His dad was the school music teacher there. Uh, Randy Shaw played trumpet, he played well at the time, and uh, we had uh, Heike Tam, who was a PhD student in engineering, playing piano. Uh, Terry Kennedy played guitar for a while, Keith Bartlett was on guitar for a while, um, Andy Pedersen on, on drums, Mike Mullen sometimes played drums. So we had kind of a, the core, core group though, the four or five of us, uh, Mary and I, and um, Randy and Torch and Terry moved to uh, Vancouver in 1970 after I graduated to work out of there. Tell me about the name Skip. My mother called me that from when I was born. I don't know, somebody, Jackie Coogan, an actor on TV. My Christian name's Kenneth. I'm not a Christian though, and uh, it was Skippy for many years. So, always. Except when I was in school, I was too shy to say my name was Skip, so they called me Ken, you know. 
And it just stuck? And it just stuck, yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. So, you finished university in the late 60s? Yes. Moved out with a horn group, and it was a little trickier because at that time, although there was some work kind of in, <clears throat> in schools and in universities, like single jobs, um, agencies like uh, Bruce Allen, and we auditioned for him, and he picked us up right away, uh, they couldn't really offer us much work as a six or seven piece group. It just wasn't in the cards, you know? So the eventually the horn players, they had families and they ended up uh, taking, they were both education graduates, they got teaching jobs. Um, I subbed for a while, but the group morphed into a four piece group with uh, Terry Kennedy, um, Jerry McLaughlin, who was originally worked out of CBC Saskatoon, but he worked CBC Vancouver, he played drums, Mary McLean and myself. So we became Brink and we worked for five years uh, out of Vancouver. And we played almost all the time. We came back here once in a while. We, we didn't have to travel very much because there's so many clubs in Vancouver that were going five and six nights a week. We played at Oil Can Harry's, Bumbles, the Royal Towers in New Westminster, the Admiral in Burnaby, place in Toronto River, um, Medicine Man Charlie's. So we had kind of a circuit that we would do, which was great at the time, five or six nights a week. And, you know, everything was on paper. It was all union. It was uh, it certainly didn't get rich, but you could actually make a living out of it at the time. Um, and that was really how groups were booked. We were, we played with groups, um, um, you know, that, uh, you know, we're doing it for years and subsequent to our leaving and there's, they were still doing it for another five years after we finished, you know, but those days are not around anymore. So it was a good time to be kind of in the business. We didn't have to augment our living with anything else, right? you know. What kind of material was the group doing in the early 70s? Cover tunes, and we did uh, kind of, our thing was more like a soft rock, everything from Bobby, McGee, to Proud, Mary. It's like music that you had, had to have drink before you played for the 1500th time, you know? So I did get tired of it. I'm not sure I turned into a better player playing a lot of it and things like that. But at the time, it was a nice way to make a living, you know? Um, it did, you know, for some people, I think they really, really enjoyed it. For me, maybe not so much near the end. It got to be a bit of a, a grind, the same old, same old, you know, and learning the same kind of tunes. Cover tunes, you had a little bit of latitude, but uh, agencies like Bruce and things like that, he wanted things fairly straight. He didn't want things too outside the box. He wanted to make sure people heard tunes they liked and blah, blah, blah. So we had a long, wide variety of tunes, most of which I guess probably we grew tired of, you know. But at the time, it was a great experience. How important was it with that group to stay, you know, top 40 current? Well, you know, we did try writing, but it really wasn't our thing. Um, it was top 40 in a sense, uh, and we would add tunes, you know, as we went along. But it wasn't really, I think the, um, the cover groups that were playing harder material and things like that had more pressure on them to stay current than we did. We were playing, I think, probably for a bit of an older crowd, you know, in the lounges. Like we played in the Devonshire Hotel and the Cats Whiskers, they hired us for a year, six nights a week. You know, we played the same place, you know, great job, but it was upscale lounge, you know, and all the clientele looked like they had a lot of money and some of them did and some of them didn't. And, uh, even though they were all dressed up and things like that, I knew a few of them were packing eaters too. There was, you know, <laughs> it, was, uh, it was a good, shill for some people and that's where the money was and so there was an interesting group of people around at the time so um so the music wasn't it was kind of the i would say at more on the adult contemporary kind of line you know right. and soft rock you know well it actually seemed to work for a lot of the nightclubs looking back it probably think, didn't seem so soft rock at the time, but now probably it would not. definitely be classified as that. That's right. Yeah. And a group like our horn group would have never really fit in 
to most of those venues and things like that. Unless you had something that was, you know, some contemporary hits and things like that, which we didn't. And there was no, although, you know, some people recorded, we did a little bit of it. There wasn't a lot of the same pressure to record. You know, it was expensive at the time. Um, it was iffy. There wasn't many producers around, like Claire Lawrence was one of the few people in town. He was busy or he was out of town. So it was kind of a different time and that kind of pressure wasn't the same way. There was no expectation that you'd have a, a CD or an LP for a calling card or anything like that, you know. Do you have promo photos for the groups back then? I've got a, a few things that I can send you, you know. Yeah, cool. I'd have to look, check again my yeah. hope chest, Terry. Okay. <laughs> some of it I've forgotten, but yeah, I've got some of that stuff. Ned yeah. Powers always did a good job of giving you coverage. Yeah, I think he was very fair, fair to us. I think he was interested because, um, you know, subsequent to coming back, um, that's when I joined up with Boomhauer with uh, Jazz Workshop. And, of course, we got a lot of work, way more probably than our share. Um, and uh, it was kind of the only game in town doing that kind of stuff at the same, you know, at that time with Bobby... Claxon who lives down the street so but at that time when I came back I went into graduate school they um, I had friends at the park town so I, I took over the room at the park town I ran that for three four five years and brought in folk and you know small jazz groups mm -hmm. you know for weekends and it was kind of you know during the winter Did season you get from, busy in there it was twice. busy we had some really you know, we had some very good kind of entertainers. Uh, you know, we had, you know, people from, you know, Connie Caldor to Paul Han, Rich Pete White, Richard White. Um, you know, we had a couple of small, two, it was small, so we had two or three piece jazz groups and Workshop played there. Uh, Alan Kellogg, who we've played with a, quite a bit, he was with the um, Ohio Express for a while, you know. So he sang there and blah. So it was kind of an interesting of uh, um, alternative music and things like that. So, mm -hmm. and uh, no cover, so people could come in and have a drink or supper. And that kind of the group attracted. I think they had a few bucks, so um, they were always happy with. Uh, kept their place full on the weekend. They sold some meals and things like that. And we didn't pay big wages, but we made sure they were all you know well above scale. And you know there was something for. A, you know, Don Freed played there, and um, and Ross Campbell. I spent a lot of time with those guys too over the years. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So it was interesting at the time, you know. How was the you know the whole overview of the nightclub scene in the seventies when you look back at it now? Yeah. Well, when we were in Vancouver, we came when we came back, you know, for Christmas or something like that. We usually played um, at the Dell or Yips. And um, I don't think I played Jacks, but uh, one of those two. And of course, I was hopping in those days in the 70s. Uh, we always got a good crowd. Um, uh, you know, I think that, that there was a couple of things that happened um, that were involved with. One of them, when they changed kind of the licensing requirements for clubs that they allowed um, recorded music as well as live music. Um, and when the disco era came on, there was a marked drop off in the amount of work, you know, around town. Um, I remember when I got back, I even played somebody, I saw on the net the other day, something about Jimmy Arthur Orridge, who I haven't heard for a long time. I played a week with him. Somebody, they needed a bass player. I've never, I never heard of him. And, uh, it was real interesting. He didn't even like me playing scales between C and F. He just wanted C, and then he wanted F, you know. But he was really good. I learned a lot, you know, and a really nice guy. And, and those country guys really worked hard. That bar K was the busiest and the most lucrative bar in the province for a long time, you know. Um, but they had a formula down and things like that. But you could see when things started to change that just bit by bit, kind of the, the, the clientele base became eroded you know, and things changed, you know, uh, and they morphed into 
more specialty kind of bars uh, with special, you know, kind of either alternative kind of music or, you know, heavy rock and age specific kind of bars rather than kind of more um, cosmopolitan kind of venues and stuff like that. So um, I think probably in the club scene, I was fortunate to be around at the right time where you could actually kind of make a living and maybe get better at what you do, ply your trade a little bit. A um, little more difficult um, in the late 70s and 80s, things start to, to change into, you know, and then we, you know, we've got that kind of whole uh, situation now where, if, especially if you're a young band and things like that, you're playing for the door, you're on a bill with three other bands and, you know, and so, you know, what it means really, Terry, is that uh, music's become, you know, kind of for the children of the privilege, they're the only ones that can afford, you know, if you're trying to learn your trade or get better or play in front of a group, a live group, pretty tough going. Why do you think in the early 70s the nightclub scene did get as big as it did? Why? Why that? Um, well, I guess there was, you know, maybe no internet and things like that. If you wanted to meet somebody and things like that, that's where you went, you know. And um, I think that uh, in a place like this, and maybe it was different down east. <clears throat> I don't think it was too different from Vancouver and things like that. I think that uh, after we got over kind of the, you know, the drug generation of the 60s, people went back to alcohol, you know, kind of and and a mix of alcohol and drugs, and um, that was where everybody hung out, and that's where you met people, and <clears throat> I don't think people worried if they were over zero eight when they stepped in the car, you know, at the end of the night and stuff like that. So it seemed to be a, kind of a natural, you know, place <clears throat> for a, gen, you know, kind of a multi-generational group to get together. So throughout the 70s, you're, you're still making your full-time living off music only? No, um, I decided to go back when I got back here. <clears throat> I decided that I would go back to school. So I went and took a graduate degree in education in educational foundations. And I got some scholarship money that I could live on. <clears throat> so I did that and played. But I ran into Boomhauer, who I knew in the old days. We actually had a band in grade six in Brunskill School together. So Boomhauer, uh, Doug and I, and um, Bobby Claxon, you know, uh, basically it was Doug's group. And I think Curtis Beaumont played for a little bit before I got here. Then I um, okay. got back and I took over kind of the bass part. So we had um, Hans Van Noren on the drums, three, you know, uh, no piano. Or, and Bobby, so we had a little kind of quartet and we decided, you know, that's when we started at the park town and Gus Verbeck there said, well, geez, I don't know if I can keep this going. And I said, well, you want someone to run it? So they paid me a very small amount and they gave me a bar tab that I could buy people drinks with. And um, we put the ads in the paper. It was fairly seamless. And uh, I then Workshop started playing a lot, you know, because once again, we were kind of the only, you know, other than Gordy and my dad at the time, although Gordy died soon after, we were kind of the only game in town that was doing kind of, well, we did jazz, but we also did, um, you know, we did some pop stuff and some kind of rearranged folk stuff. It was always kind of arranged for jazz trio. We did a little bit of funky, you know, funky music and things like that, the odd country tune just something that was eclectic and different. And so we worked um, and, uh, we, you know, I mean, enough. It was weekend work and it was, you know, one or two days. Uh, played in Regina, played here, played Calgary, Edmonton, and, uh, and then quite a few, you know, like cocktail jobs and things like that. So that group went on for like 20 years, you know, more or less on and off. And uh, we did one, two, we did a show for the CFQC, we've got uh, TV, and we did a national CBC show at the time. Nobody got a national CBC show out of here. And uh, one of those global shows that other people did. We negotiated, the union kind of negotiated that with Global, that they'd pay wages and do a proper job of recording people. So we did, uh, you know, those 
program, so it was yeah, and it was enjoyable at the time. Would the group have rehearsed much, or so we just yeah, we stuff? had to keep, you know, we had to keep kind of on top of it. Uh, some of the things that we're playing weren't easy. Um, I found like the pop stuff to be pretty easy compared to the jazz tunes, and I was playing a lot of stand up. I play some tunes on bass guitar, and I'm not a great bass guitar player, but. Um, so it was more difficult, you know, especially there was, there was more holes in it. There was no piano or organ in the background and it was at a level that you could hear everything, you know. So there was not a hell of a lot of room for, you know. And when we did TV shows, like we'd pick up Craig uh, Salkel playing trumpet or um, Greg Delaron did a TV show with us. And, I, you know, I played a few with knowing Boomhauer, then I played with Delaron. You know, so Delaron and Boomhauer and I would play at the, uh, you know, Amigos or this or that. So there was a few kind of offshoots to that, but not many. We had enough stuff that with my date work in the day, I, I actually got a job in the late 70s. And, you know, I had enough to do, so I didn't want to play all the time. But I, I, the quality of the jobs I got was pretty good.